Hi everyone, how's it going? This is Leia with Headwater Science Institute. I'm so excited to welcome you to night two of our spring research student presentations. You're gonna see a lot of good research today and you're even gonna be able to meet the student mentors who have worked really hard to guide these projects as well. So real quick, before we get into that, I just wanted to let you know that if you're someone with a student or a child that's prospectively interested in our summer programs, this is a really great way to see the kinds of research that students can do during a research program. So we have a girls camp and a regular research program coming up this summer. And if you're interested and want to register for that after seeing what they're going to present tonight, you can head over to our website and we're accepting registration as we speak. The last thing before we get into all this cool research is that this week kind of kicks off three weeks of awesome Headwaters events. So on the 30th of April, you can join us for a live Arbor Day science lesson about planting native plants. And then on May 6th, we've got a really fun Zoom trivia night. So feel free to check out our website for any of that stuff. A bunch of really exciting events happening all in the name of science. So to get into the work, First off, I'm going to introduce mentor Ashley Pierce, who is going to bring on her student, Colin. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Leia. I'll let you take it away. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Ashley Pierce, and I currently work at the National Science Foundation in Washington, DC. But my PhD research was focused on understanding the sources of pollutants in the air, such as ozone, particulate matter, and mercury. And I'd like to introduce Colin Saltzgaber, who is a junior at the Nueva School in California. I think we all know how tough junior year can be, and this is a particularly tough time on top of that. And I've really appreciated Colin's attitude. He has been showing up and working on extra projects, while also having enthusiasm for things that he enjoys, like golf and selling shoes and mineralogy, which he'll be talking a bit about tonight. So I'll let Colin take it from here. Sweet. Yeah. What's up, guys? Uh, I'm Colin. I'm 17. Um, I live in the Bay Area. I go to the Nueva School um, in San Mateo, California. Um, I worked with Ashley this year. This is my second time with Headwaters. I did um, a summer program. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really fun. Um, I highly recommend it to all of you prospective students. So uh, without further ado, let me talk about my project for the spring. Um, I looked at point counting efficiency. So as Ashley said, I worked with her. Um, yeah, so a brief overview of point counting. Um, point counting is a method used by mineralogists um, with the goal of estimating proportions of minerals within a rock. So um, rocks are aggregates of minerals, they're formed of minerals. Um, there are some times when you can see the actual minerals within a rock, say granite, for example, you know, you can see some of the shiny quartz, you can see feldspar, but then also rocks that are just outside that don't look very shiny. They're still composed of minerals, but it's just kind of compacted and ground up minerals. So point counting aims to estimate proportions of minerals within a rock. Um, the way it works is you have a set defined spacing, uh, for example, two centimeters, maybe five, maybe one centimeter. Um, and essentially you draw kind of crosshairs, you draw grids at each of those spacings and you record the mineral at each crosshair at each X. I'll have a picture on the next slide which should hopefully give you a better visualization. Um, and this lets you calculate the proportions of each mineral. So the proportion for mineral A, for example, within a rock would just be the total counts of mineral A over the total counts um, or the total, total points that you counted. So pretty simple math there. Um, it is a very tedious process um, and it's mostly done by hand. I'll explain why. And so here's an example. So let's say the spacing here is roughly maybe 0.5 millimeters. And you can see you draw these squares um, at this kind of given interval or spacing. Um, and so for point counting, you would go from maybe the top left or however you want to go about it. But you count each of the crosshairs. And at each crosshair, which overlays a certain mineral um, within this rock, you'd record it. So maybe top left here, you'd see this white circle. Uh, maybe that um, mineral is feldspar, you'd tally one for feldspar. So you'd go throughout it and you just record. Um, but as you can see this here, looking at it, maybe it's what, like 60 points or something. It's already kind of tedious and it can take some time. That's why my project's aimed at looking at efficiency. Um, so what I was building, building off of what I was saying of how it's tedious and why it has to be done by hand, um, AI or artificial intelligence, like doing it by a computer has been experimented with 
However, it's kind of hard to distinguish between certain minerals to meet an accuracy um, that's accepted in the science world. So that's why point counting has been done by hand. So for this project, what I did was I wanted to see if we could find efficiency within point counting. So I tested two different grid spacings. So as you saw on the last slide, that was an example of a 5.5 millimeter spacing. So I looked at two spacings that I chose, three centimeters and five centimeters. Um, and I used inferential statistics to test for statistical significance to see if there was a true difference. In other words, like see if five centimeters is okay um, and gave kind of accurate results around the three centimeter range um, because five centimeters would save people time. It's bigger spacing, so you have less work to do. So yeah, looking at efficiency between the two spacing using inferential statistics, um, that was my project. So I'll walk you through what I did. So kind of my research question here, I'll just leave it up here. Um, kind of it's examining the results and how they differ um, between the five centimeter and the three centimeter spacing. Um, I have my hypotheses here, which I use for doing my inferential statistics stuff. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, my methods, uh, I listed it out here, but I'll elaborate on it as I go throughout my presentation. But um, I used five sample sheets from a volcano. I didn't go to the volcano. It was probably a little too warm, but someone else got it for me. So that was very nice of her. Um, I recorded the total number of minerals. So I'll get into this a bit more, but my sample sheets had two minerals within it and it had two other components. It had ground mass, which is just like super, super crushed up minerals that you can't distinguish um, and air bubbles. So I recorded the number of that, of those components. I did that for my two specific spacings, five and three centimeters. Um, this is where I did inferential statistics. So I created confidence interval for each sample and each component within the, each sample. Um, and then I compared the ranges of the intervals, the five, the five centimeter and three centimeter interval for each sample for each component. I know it's confusing. I'll get to it a little bit more to test for sig statistical significance. So, yeah. Uh, so here's an example of like a five centimeter sheet. So the grid's it's kind of hard to see. I should have put a red line around it, but oopsies. Um, you can see it's five centimeters in spacing. So maybe roughly 48 crosshairs. Uh, you kind of can see them. They're the black lines, but I apologize. Um, for example, within here, uh, we can see different types of minerals. Uh, the green blobs are a category of minerals called mafic minerals. The white kind of blobs are called air bubbles. Um, the black stuff is mostly ground mass. And the last component, feldspar, it's like gray rectangles and they're pretty tiny. So basically I'd go over each crosshair and I'd record it. And to the best of my abilities, I'd pick you know, which one I thought it landed on. But again, this is kind of where bias comes into play, which I'll talk about for sources of error. Here's three centimeters. It's like 96. So it's kind of boring. And then, uh, yeah, one centimeter, this is 280. It's pretty rough. Uh, I threw on some music and kind of grinded it out, but you know, it took like an hour. So this is kind of where it gets into the tedious side, um, which is why I kind of examined the five centimeter, the three centimeter spacing. But yeah, this is kind of what I did. So I'd record each crosshair, record each mineral there and tally it up. And then um, leads me to my data figures. This is from one of my five samples. So I call it like sample one. Um, so I have my three centimeter um, columns and my five centimeter columns. So as you can see, I have the count for each. Obviously the five has less points counted than the three because it's bigger spacing. But you can see like I have um, for the three centimeter spacing, I have 15 counts of feldspar over 96 total. Get, that gives me 16% feldspar. So I kind of did that for all of them. As I said, the proportion of mineral A, for example, feldspar, it's like the number of total counts of feldspar over the total counts. So pretty straightforward math there, but I did that for all five of my samples. And I took this data, I created confidence intervals. So that kind of estimates the whether where the mean would lie, like the population mean of let's say feldspar for my three centimeters and feldspar for my five centimeter range. But essentially it gives you a range with like 95% confidence, or in this case, I chose 95% confidence that the mean population of the population mean of these components would lie in. But basically you test these intervals against each other and if they fail to overlap, yeah, if they fail to, no, if they overlap, that means there is no statistical significance. If they fail to overlap, there is statistical significance. But as you can see, I have all four of my components here, my three to five centimeters um, comparison, and you can see that they all uh, overlap each other. So that means that there is no statistical significance, but hey, that's not a bad thing. 
Like it's no big deal. Unfortunately, we don't get a, we fail to reject the null. However, just because, you know, because we suggested that there is no statistical significance between the two, that means we can say that the five centimeter spacing, which is a little easier and less tedious, it returns results that are, you know, good enough um, or sufficient um, to those of the three centimeter spacing. So like, yeah, we didn't, we failed to reject the null and, you know, we didn't get anything statistically significant, but we saved ourselves some time. So that was kind of a plus. So that's my conclusion for that side of my data analysis. But also I want to talk about sources of error. I know I'm running kind of low on time, but um, some sources of error because it's always good to identify those. Um, a lack of samples. I only did five and, you know, they could have somehow been biased towards my conclusion. So the more, the better. That's what stats people like to say. Um, the samples may have not represented the true population of rocks. So maybe I could say this applied to the volcano that I collected with, but it might not apply to the rock in my backyard. So there's that too. Um, and also, as I said, and this kind of goes with point counting in general, is that there's bias in determining. So maybe the crosshair landed on, you know, 50-50 of a green mafic, a mineral and, you know, a bubble. You know, maybe I like green more. So maybe I picked it subconsciously, but there's bias there too. So, you know, there could have been some slight bias there. Um, further research, kind of building off of what I said, um, definitely examine other spacings. Um, so maybe ones that would potentially return statistically significant. So maybe if I compared five with a seven and seven returns statistically significant to five, then I could say that, you know, you can't really use seven and five is kind of the max. So that'd be cool. Um, as I said, probably survey more samples, uh, maybe from like a rock in my backyard or something. The more diversity, the better. It helps strengthen conclusion and results. Um, and overall, it's just is better and it increases accuracy and precision. And last thing, which would be super cool, but I didn't have time to do, um, is to determine whether these results apply universally, like to other rocks, or they differ. You know, maybe rocks that are in Yosemite differ than rocks that are in like Zion National Park. Like maybe desert rocks are different than granite rocks. Um, but yeah, that, that was my presentation. Um, I hope you guys kind of followed along and understood it. I know it can get a little confusing explaining inferential statistics over a presentation. But um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with Ashley um, over the spring, um, and I hope you guys enjoyed. So uh, yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? Great. Thanks, Colin. Um, no and we will take some questions now if anyone has them. I think I will kick it off. Um, so Colin, if you could do this research project again, is what would you do differently? Um, kind of building off what I said on the further research, um, I would probably examine other types of rocks, maybe from you know my backyard, maybe from different. I'm a big lover of national parks, so you know maybe I could examine one from Yosemite, build off my research over the summer, maybe do one from Zion, but you know expand from just looking at a volcano because the composition of rocks. You know, there's thousands of minerals out there. I only examined two um, that lied within this volcano. So probably see others around the world or just different types and see if my results from this one were or could be used or compared to the results that I found there. So that'd be cool. It'd take a lot more time, but, you know, I'd be down. Yeah. So we have another question um, from Faraby. I believe that's how you say that. Sorry if I mispronounce it. Sure. Um, what did you find most difficult about your research project? Uh, easy. <laughs> yeah, definitely just counting it up. Um, I like inferential statistics, which is why I chose to kind of combine my passion with mineralogy in this. So learning confidence intervals and doing that was no big deal. Um, I definitely think that sitting down um, and counting out the grid, the crosshairs and stuff took a lot of time. I wouldn't say maybe it was the most difficult, but it was the most tedious. Um, I think honestly, yeah, it'd probably, it'd probably be that. Inferential statistics went by pretty easy. But so, yeah, to answer your question, probably sitting down and counting out all those points and recording it because sometimes I'd miscount and have to go backtrace and stuff. So that was a little bit tough. I bet. Um, so another question, why do you like mineralogy? Um, I could ramble about this for a bit, but I'll keep it pretty You have like 30 seconds. Okay. My dad... <laughs> loves minerals too he worked at like a mineral shop as like a teenager before like i even got a job um and so he grew up collecting minerals and he actually um is a part owner in two crystal mines across the us one in reno nevada and one in georgia that produce quartz crystals and quartz scepters so over the years i've gone to go dig with him and kind of when i've grown up 
into my teenage years, I wanted to look at the composition of minerals and learn more about the science behind it. So the combination of him and kind of my interest in science drove my passion for mineralogy. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Colin and Ashley. No problem. I appreciate you presenting. Great work. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Now I'm going to pull in Jennifer Hepner to introduce your student. Hi, everyone. I am Jennifer Hepner. I am a graduate student, PhD student at the University of Nevada, Reno, studying physiological and behavioral differences in birds across an urban gradient. And I would now like to introduce Brian, who is a fantastic ornithologist and an avid bird watcher who goes to Redwood High School. And I specifically don't say aspiring ornithologist because he could already easily run circles around me when IDing birds, which makes sense because he's super local or super active in his local birding community. Um, and I'm constantly blown away by Brian's dedication, especially to his field work. If you don't know, Avian research is not one for those who like to sleep in. So with his passions for with birds, he'd like to pursue work in avian research or conservation. So without further ado, I'd like to let Brian tell you all about his cool research. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. As Jennifer said, uh, my name is Brian Brown. I'm from Redwood High School. And my study was on the effects of wind direction on the altitude of avian migrants. The migration patterns of birds are incredibly complex from how they navigate to how they respond to their environment. Their methods of navigation vary, some including tapping into the Earth's magnetic field or using the stars, as well as using landmarks. Ridgelines are a landmark that birds frequently follow for miles if the ridge is oriented parallel to the direction that birds want to go. As ridgelines converge, all the birds flying along them merge together, creating concentrated bird highways. Migration is very energetically expensive and dangerous, and birds have to contend with a variety of environmental conditions that detrimentally affect their migration. These range from long-term issues like the vanishing of stopover habitat along their routes that would provide them with food and shelter, to predators hunting them along their journey, obstacles like mountain ranges and large bodies of water, and harsh weather like storms and wind. I wanted to specifically research the effects of wind direction on birds' migration patterns. In the study, I investigated the effects of northern winds, which are coming from the north, and southern winds coming from the south, on the altitude of birds migrating north in the spring relative to, relative to the ridgeline that they were flying along. The research question that I seek to answer was how do northern and southern winds affect the altitude of my birds in the spring? My independent variables were the wind direction and orientation of birds at the ridgeline, while my dependent variable was the number of birds. I hypothesized that southern winds will influence migrating birds to fly higher above the ridgeline, while northern winds will lead to birds flying below the ridgeline. It's important for birds to conserve energy during migration, which is incredibly energetically expensive. Flying in more sheltered areas like canyons below the ridgeline allows for less wind resistance and there's a northern headwind. On the other hand, when there's a southern tailwind, they will fly higher to maximize the boost gained by the wind. From methods, I arrived at the blythdale Cordomadera Ridge Junction an hour after sunrise, where I sat at the highest point of the ridge, about 20 yards north of the junction. There I had a vantage point over the canyon and ridgeline, as well as unobstructed views of the skies above them. I observed birds migrating north and recorded in the eBird mobile app the species of each bird and whether it was above or below the ridgeline. I completed that process six total times, with three times being with northern winds and three with southern. After the data was collected, I analyzed it in the coding software R using a two-way ANOVA with an interaction between the orientation of birds to the ridgeline and the wind direction. Uh, in this left-hand image, it shows the perspective of the observation point while facing north. And you can see the ridgeline extending north on the right-hand side and then the top of the canyon on the left hand side um, and on the right hand side you can see the canyon in more detail this is facing south and then the ridge is just a little bit on the left hand side this graph illustrates the discrepancies between the number of migrating birds above and below the ridge line on days with northern winds and days with southern winds on the x-axis are two sections northern winds and southern winds 
the y-axis shows the total number of birds. This shows the striking difference between the numbers of birds above and below the ridgelines on days with opposite winds. As you can see, on days with northern winds, the vast majority of birds were below the ridgeline, and on days with southern winds, the opposite is apparent. The statistical test I ran was a two-way ANOVA in R. As you can see in the table, while wind direction and orientation to the ridgeline are not significant by themselves, the interaction between wind direction and birds' orientation to the ridgeline was very significant. This means that wind direction does indeed affect the migrating behavior of birds and that the specific direction of wind affects whether more birds would fly above or below the ridgeline. On days with southern winds, birds did generally fly higher with 84% above, and on days with northern winds, birds tended to fly lower with the same percentage, coincidentally, 84%. This may be due to birds trying to optimize energy efficiency and minimize wind resistance. On days with a southern tailwind, flying higher allows them to take advantage of stronger tailwinds as they fly north, and on days with a northern headwind, flying lower and more sheltered airways could decrease wind resistance. These details while flying could help them save just enough energy to outmaneuver a predator or make it over a body of water. During the experiment, Variables that could bias data collection were slight differences in temperature on the days that I collected data, and the fact that it's slightly easier to see birds when they're against the sky in comparison to the ridge on the other side of the canyon. The results of this study may not directly aid conservation efforts, but it may prove helpful in other scientists' experiments, allowing them to gather more accurate and a greater quantity of data that can help to conserve migrating birds. Migration, as I said, is dangerous for birds, so discovering everything that we can about their behaviors is very important. Since 1970, we have lost one out of four birds from our skies. Conservation is more important than ever, and the more knowledge we have about every aspect of birds' lives, the more effective our efforts are. In terms of possible future research, a trend that I noticed during data collection was that many larger birds tended to fly higher. So many of the birds flying above the ridge during northern winds were hawks or vultures, whose situs and strength allowed them to fight the wind. This poses the question, how does wind direction affect different species during migration? Collecting data on how wind direction affects birds of different body masses may yield interesting results. Uh, on this side, you can see the pictures of some larger birds flying above and then a bird that was turning around a turkey vulture in the canyon. I'd like to acknowledge the people that guided me along the process of this project and made it possible. Teachers and mentors at the Headwaters Institute include Spencer Houston, Megan Seifert, and Daniel Dudek gave me the tools and the knowledge to carry out this work. My parents woke up early in the morning to drive me to the ridge in order for me to collect data. And finally, my mentor Jennifer answered all my questions and spent weeks working with me to complete this study. Um, here are my works cited. All photos in the presentation were taken by me. Uh, questions? All right, that was great, Brian. Good job. Um, so I will start off with a question for you. Um, what other environmental factors do you think could be affecting the birds that you're seeing along this specific bridge line you were studying? Um, I think, well, obviously different weather like rain and um, like fog that comes into the va valley, into the canyon can affect how many birds, because um, they tend to not want to fly when there's more uh, things against them like rain. So they'll keep the birds down and they'll you'll see a lot more birds like singing from the trees in the canyon that are just staying put and uh, fueling up before they keep going. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to study bird migration? Um, I think that it's really complex and interesting. Um, so I think that gathering any data about it can be helpful. And then also, um, it's very nice to watch birds as they migrate along that ridge because um, it's a rare opportunity. Most birds migrate at night. So, and it's hard because like they don't have to follow roads. They can 
travel wherever so it's hard to find a concentrated area so being on that ridge allows me to get to watch a lot of birds just sitting down pass by awesome well we have a question coming in really neat that you took your own photos for evidence as well were there any challenges to capturing the photos um there are challenges especially when the birds are high up or moving fast uh when on the ridge um I've been taking photos of birds for a number of years, so I've been uh, I've gotten pretty experienced in like tracking them, and but it's it's still is hard, and it's hard to get like crisp photos as they fly. All right, we have another question. How would you continue this research if given an opportunity? Um, I might continue, maybe do the same research at another ridge or multiple other ridges. Um, and also I'd like to experiment on how, what the differences are between my ridge, which was kind of on the base side of my county, Marin, um, and compare that to the ridges on the coast. All right, and another question. Brian, how will your passion and keen interest in all aspects of bird behaviors impact your life in the future? Um, well, my passion, uh, will hopefully lead to a career in studying birds and conservation. So it seems like the path my life is going to take, and uh, hopefully I can make a difference in the field of conservation in the or field of ornithology. And that's always needed. Maybe one last question is just tell us what's one of your favorite bird species you love to observe in the wild. Um, Burrowing owls are always pretty cool. You don't get to see them too often. Um, and when you do, they, uh, they're they like kind of hidden, hidden along the ground and then suddenly you just kind of see them. Usually you just see their eyes and then they just kind of sit there and you can watch them and they're so small. So they're fun to watch. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us all. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Jennifer. It's obvious that you're very passionate about this work. So we look forward to seeing where you'll go. So I am excited to bring on our next mentor, Daniel Dudek, and I'll let him introduce his first student. All right. Thank you, Leah. Um, my name is Daniel Dudek. I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, a lot of my research is pretty much involved phylogenetics, systematics, taxonomy. So you know, everything that, you know, goes into delimiting species, especially in amphibians and tree frogs, that's sort of, you know, where, where all my research lies. Um, but today I'm extremely excited to um, introduce Isaiah Faraby. Um, he's actually coming to us from Maryland. So, you know, he's, he's coming from the East Coast, um, you know, joining pretty much everyone in this classroom that's on the West Coast. And I'm really glad to hear and, you know, hear him discuss his research on water chemistry. And so I did take it away. Thank you, Mr. Judek. So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Isaiah Faraby. And as Mr. Judek said, I am from Maryland. Um, I'm in 10th grade and I go to Hope Academy. So me and my co-author, Mr. Judek, have founded a water quality study that concerns but primarily Patuxent River, Jug Bay, specifically Jug Bay, and Cedarville State Forest, specifically Cedarville Pond and Wolfden Creek. Water quality studies are usually straightforward, but they're essential nonetheless to local populations because water itself is so essential. Moving straight into the introduction, overarching topic of this experiment would be water quality, specifically in terms of chemical composition of local bodies of water and then comparing and contrasting them. This question is of interest because water pollution does not only take a toll on its ecosystem, but human populations and society as well. I find it very important personally because I constantly observe um, in these bodies of water, like people partaking act in activities such as fishing, and I want to know how water quality impacts activities such as that. However, this experiment solely focuses on Cedarville State Forest and Jug Bay, which are both located in Maryland. So my research question for this experiment was, how does Patuxent River and Cedarville State Forest compare and contrast in terms of pH and nitrate levels, and therefore water quality? 
and my hypothesis entails that I predict that Patuxent River will have a difference in terms of pH and nitrate compared to Cedarville State Forest. So to conduct this experiment, it's very straightforward. First, you will just need a lab notebook and then second, water strips, indicating nitrate, nitrite, alkalinity, hardness, chlorine, and pH. The procedure entails venturing to riverside sites at Cedarville and Patuxent to establish a controlled research area and then using test strips to measure pH, nitrate, nitrite, alkalinity, chlorine, and hardness of water according to the instructions and then recording those results. And then you actually repeat it eight times at each body of water in separate locations um, for a totality of 16 trials in all. And then you would compare and contrast the averages and then determine the water quality differences in both bodies of water. Naturally, this leads to the results. The results for my pH sub experiment can be seen in figure 1.0. Um, it displays the contrast between both bodies of water in terms of pH. As one can observe, Patuxent has a 0.4 average increase in pH compared to Cedarville. And I should mention the two tailed p value is 0.0008, which is statistically significant. As you can see in figure 1.0, Cedarville Forest has a pH of 6.8, while Patuxent River has a pH of 7.2. And the results for the nitrate sub-experiment, um, the difference of nitrate levels of these bodies of water are also statistically significant, with the p-value equaling 0 0.0001. Um, Cedarville exhibits no signs of any nitrate levels whatsoever, while Patuxent River displays high levels of nitrate. As you can see in Figure 2.0, Patuxent River has 15 units of nitrate, while Cedarville Forest has absolutely zero. Moving on, the discussion how this actually applies to general experiment. Well, Patuxent River has heightened levels of nitrate relative to Cedarville, essentially the control, while having an alkaline leaning pH. Cedarville has a non-existent nitrate presence and has a more directly neutral pH. So a possible reasoning behind this is that Patuxent has significant industrial and agricultural as well as residential sites immediately surrounding it that could potentially lead to variables such as fertilizer runoff and carbon emission. And there also has been evidence in previous studies that such variables can affect Patuxent River significantly. So, but while Cedarville, on the other hand, is unaffected by such human activity, so that the environment does not suffer from these specific variables. This could be a result of Cedarville State Forest being a statewide protected area. So in conclusion of this experiment, Patuxent River is a vital body of water on the eastern shore, specifically impacting Maryland and our state's capital, Washington, D.C. High-end industrial, agricultural, and residential encroachment has contributed immensely to the observed reduced water quality within these bodies of water. So the potential reasoning, the reasoning for this experiment is to display truly how much of a difference there is in the water quality of a body of water that is daily affected and continues to be affected by such human activity and another that is practically exempt from it. It displays the need for legislative action to instill prevention measures to secure such essential natural ecosystems. So for future directions, how future scientists should expand and really um, progress on this original experiment, will be incorporating variables such as alkalinity, total hardness, nitrite, total chlorine, and TDS into the results of the experiment to more complexly evaluate chemical, chemical composition within the bodies of water. The second could be including local animal species and plant species as well, and how the water quality of those bodies of water can affect them in particular. And then third would be investigating human industrial and residential involvement that has been taking place and increasing along the Patuxent. So with that wrapped up, I would like to make some brief dedications. First to my mother, who has always supported me and always drove to the sites I needed to collect data. Uh, furthermore, to um, Daniel Dudek, a fellow author and my mentor, who, Dan who donated so much time and effort to this project. And then my next dedication goes to Spencer Uzden, Megan Seifert, and all those involved at Headwater Science Institute for inculcating me on the art of research. And last but certainly not least, Carrie Spooler, who edited the manuscript for this research project. And yeah, that briefly sums it up. And available for questions. All right. Well, great job, Isaiah. 
Thanks. No, I guess um, I'll kick off the questions first. Um, so my main question actually pertains to your sort of nitrate levels that, you know, massive discrepancy that we, that we saw. Um, why do you think that you observed um, the nitrate levels equating to zero? Do you think it was zero? Do you, like, what, what might have caused that? What do you think? Well, oh, oh, sorry. Um, well, well, I examined several parts of Cedarville Forest and like several of the ravines leading up to Cedarville Pond. And all tests suggest that there was actually no nitrate presence whatsoever within the water. And I do think partially because it's a forested area, but also because like there's great statewide, well, governmental effort to preserve like um, the water quality of bodies of water such as Cedarville. While in Patuxent, there's a lot more, I guess, flexibility when it comes to like industrial and agricultural sites and where it can be placed near the, that body of water. All right, thank you. So it looks like we have a question from Francis. Um, what are the potential consequences or benefits of the differences in water quality at the two sites? And uh, that's a great question. So I would say for Rituxan River, there's um, a huge consequence, negative consequence if continued industrial and agricultural encroachment continues along the Patuxent River, not only for natural ecosystems like around the Patuxent um, that would specifically impact like animal and plant species, but I think human um, human life as well. As you can see, like continued sewage waste and things like that can also affect um, human populations even around the Chesapeake Bay and in our nation's cap and in our nation's capital. All right, here's a question. Here's another one. Based on your future directions listed, what area of research would you like to move forward in? I think that I would choose the second one, which would be incorporating animal species and plant species and how they are specifically impacted by water quality, because I think that's also very important in evaluating an ecosystem's health. All right, so I guess, um, you know, one of my questions following up on that one, um, when you were out there sampling, you know, getting your water quality samples, um, did you notice any differences? Were, was there sort of a lack of life in the more impacted areas that, you know, that had the surrounding agriculture area? Or did you find more life and more biodiversity in the areas in the state forest? Uh, that's a great question. In Patuxent River, even though I did only observe coastal sites, so that might have its own bias attached to it, um, I did not observe as much life, I don't think, as I did in Cedarville. Because in Patuxent River, there is a lot more, um, especially when it comes to animal life and plant life, there is, it seemed like there was an absence. While in Cedarville, there was actually a lot of um, plant life in the actual bodies of water. And also I did observe some minnows as well in like the Wolf Den Creeks that I did not observe in Patuxen that did lead me with that theory. Oh, all right, so we have another one from Carla. Do you know if the Patuxent River contributes to a large source of the area's drinking water? Well, I don't think it contributes to a large source because of um, it has a bad reputation infamously as well as Chesapeake Bay. So no, it does not. At least only minimally, I would say. Yeah, let's follow up with that. How, how, and how, or why did you become interested in water quality? Well, I think water quality. Great question, by the way. I think water quality is is it's an essential. It, although it's straightforward and it's and simple, frankly, but it's very also very essential to humanity as well, basically a as a group because, um, no, oh, yeah. Yeah, that basically sums it up. All right, here we go. So also what can be done to reduce the amounts of nitrates in the river? Well, I guess that you couldn't um, directly like excavate nitrates from a river, but you can um, prohibit like certain influences that do contribute nitrates to a body of water. So that would be like reducing fertilizer use on agricultural plots that um, surround Patuxent River or like reducing carbon emission that um, 
that factories or such produce. All right. Well, um, I, I think I just have one more question for you. What was your you know, favorite part of this entire experience? I really like the sampling part and also the crafting of the manuscript, but mostly the sampling part because, well, it well, first of all, both sites were um, picturesque, I would say. They looked really nice. And I did enjoy doing the samples and actually being in the field. I, I That's just fun to me. And yeah, that's what I enjoyed the most, I think. All right, well, great job. So uh, now we're going to switch over to, um, I'd like to introduce Camille Duran. And she's from the West Coast but she did an outstanding job integrating both the ecology and the genetics of ants. So um, I would love to let her take it away. She can give you a brief introduction of herself, but yeah, she put forth so much effort, so much time into learning these very complex methods and, and it's pretty astonishing what she was able to pull off. So take it away. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, um, I'm Camille. Um, I'm a sophomore. I go to the College Preparatory School in um, Oakland, California, and I did my project on climatic preference variation across ant species. Um, so the overarching goal of my project was kind of to understand if different ant species have different climatic preferences. And just some clarification, a preference, The I mean by that, like, is there a specific climate where these ants are able to thrive best? Um, and are there specific like climatic variables such as precipitation or temperature that the different ant species prefer? And um, why is this important? Well, um, I'm gonna talk about this a lot more later, but understanding these preferences could really help us understand how ants um, might be affected by climate change in the coming centuries. So, um, and I think that's really important. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. But. Um, yeah, so my research question was, is there a difference in various ant species temperature and precipitation preferences? And I hypothesized that there was one, a noticeable genetic distinction between the species of ants I sampled, two, a significant difference in annual precipitation preference between the species, and three, a significant difference in mean temperature preference between the species. So um, my materials are all on the top left, but um, I'm gonna be going through them a little bit more in depth so you can read them if you like. Um, but I'm gonna first start with just explaining how I tested, like my process for testing my first hypothesis, which was about my various ant species, like the genetic distinction between them. So the first thing I did was I used the NCBI nucleotide database, which is just a genetic sample database. And I found samples of CO1 sequences for five ant species. They're listed below and I promise I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna talk about them in the next slide more in depth, but I found 52 samples in total um, and then I aligned those samples in MEGA, which is basically a software program that allows you to do genetic and phylogenetic analyses. And I have my a picture of my alignment, alignment right here. It's a, little, it's a little colorful box with all the letters. Um, so that's an example of what I did. And then I used that to construct what's called a phylogenetic analysis, maximum likelihood tree, a mouthful, but basically it uh, helps you observe the level of genetic variance or similarity between the species. And I will show that, but first, let's meet some ants. So um, on the top left-hand corner, we have the Campanatus pennsylvanicus. Um, you may know it as the carpenter ant. It's primarily found on like the East Coast of the US, and it prefers to kind of reside in nests in urban forests and plant communities, um, but it also does like to dwell in houses. So watch out for that. But um, the upper middle is the Cataglyphus bicolor. It's also, known as the, it's also known as the Saharan desert ant. So um, obviously it's found in the Saharan desert and notably really cool, it can withstand surface temperatures of more than 70 degrees Celsius for like short periods of time, which is pretty unique um, to that ant. Um, on the upper right hand corner, we have um, the Oocephala smaragdina on that leaf. Um, the Oocephala is also known as the green tree ant. And it's really cool. They reside in tree nests made of leaves that are held together with like the silk produced by their larva. Um, and they mainly populate Australia. Um, then on the bottom, like lower left, um, figure five, we have the Anapolepis gracilipes. It's also known as the yellow crazy ant and it gets its name because when you disturb it, it makes a ton of erratic movements. Um, and it's actually an invasive species that's largely located in the tropical and subtropical regions of the globe. Um, but it's very native to kind of like um, South and Southeast Asia. 
Um, and then finally, the bottom right hand image um, is the Urotomyrmex coeruleus, also known as the rainbow ant. It doesn't look rainbow in the photo, but under a microscope, you can see that it has like a blue iridescent sheen to it. Um, so that's where it gets its name. And the more, majority of the population actually resides is in Australia and in the, kind of like the upper northern part. Um, yeah, so then kind of zooming back out, next I'm gonna talk about my like methods for testing my second and third hypotheses about mean temperature and annual precipitation levels and preferences. So the first thing I did was I used Wallace, which is an ecological niche modeling site. There's a photo of it right here on the right. Um, but basically it allows you to see kind of and predict species distribution. So where a species kind of lives on the globe. Um, and I used it to retrieve um, the coordinates of processed occurrences for each species. So um, a processed occurrence is basically just like the location where a certain gene sample was taken. And I took the longitude and latitude, uh, latitude coordinates for um, those processed occurrences for each species. Um, next, I use them um, to conduct a climatic ANOVA in RStudio, which is with the coding program R. It's just a software program to use it easier. Um, and first for that, I had to find mean temperature and annual precipitation levels for my ants. So I input those coordinates I found from Wallace into R and um, I calculated where kind of the, those locations, um, just what the mean temperature and annual precipitation levels of those coordinates were. And um, I found those values. Then I you conducted, sorry, then I conducted the ANOVA, which stands for, which is a statistical analysis. It stands for an analysis of variance. Um, and I basically just tested um, to see if these new climate values that I found were same or distinct across the species. So I compared them um, using that um, analysis. And I'll have more on that later. But first, here is um, the data figure that I used. And this is my analysis for my first phylo hypothesis, which was um, about the phylogenetic distinction between my chosen species. Um, as you can see, each um, there's a bunch of colors on this. I'll explain what they mean. So you have different colors for each species. So for example, the one at the top is the Oocephalus smaragdina, or the green tree ant, and it's in light blue. And then like the one in the middle, which is the reddish orange thing, is the Iridomyrmex coeruleus. And basically, this is really supporting my hypothesis that there um, is a genetic distinction between the ants, because if there wasn't and all of these samples were super genetically similar, all the colors would be all over the place and they would be mixing. But right now, they're really nicely grouped and cleated together. So um, that supports my first hypothesis. Um, moving on, this is my data figure for my second and third hypotheses about whether or not my selected species had different climatic preferences. So. On the left graph here, the bar graph, um, is my annual precipitation across ant genera. So um, this graph really supports my second hypothesis that there is a difference in the preferences, as in like which uh, what level of annual precipitation each genera likes. So for example, just an example, the cataglyphus is that really, really short little kind of grayish blue one in the middle. Um, it gets about 550 millimeters of precipitation a year compared to the anapolepis, which gets about 2,300 million, uh, millimeters. So there's a big, big difference in there and that really supports the idea that there is a preference and my p-values also supported that as well. And then moving to the right graph, um, that's my mean temperature across ant genera. Um, very similar structure, but this bar graph reflects the uniqueness of each genus's average temperature preference. Um, so for example, you have the Campanatus in that lavender color. Um, that's about um, 14 degrees Celsius for its mean temperature uh, that it likes to kind of be at. And that's pretty small compared to the Oocephyla, which is the blue on the, the farthest to the right on that graph. Um, and that's at about 25 degrees Celsius. So, you know, there's like more than 10 degrees of, uh, 10 degrees like separation between the two. So that also really supports the idea that there um, is a difference in the preferences of each species. My p-values also supported this. However, as you can see, my Anapolepis Iridomyrmex and my Oocephyla, all the really tall ones on that mean temperature graph are pretty much, are very similar. Um, and I'll just kind of get to that in a while, but basically um, they're all in kind of that, a more um, tropical region and more tropical ants. Um, like I said, my results answer my original research question um, and they can kind of confirm that various ant genera um, have distinct climatic preferences for average temperature and annual precipitation of location. Um, and as I said, for my individual theses, um, hypotheses, my phylogen phylogenetic analysis tree, which was that 
um, colorful tree um, supported my first hypothesis that the um, ants are in fact genetically distinct, the different species. Um, then my climatic analysis graphs of annual precipitation and mean temperature, which were the bar graphs on my previous slide. Um, they support my second and third hypotheses respectively. Um, my second one being that there is a difference in the annual precipitation preferences of different, my different species. And the third being that there's a difference in the mean temperature um, preferences of my different species. Um, moving on, I promised that I would talk a little bit about the importance of this research, but um, so this is where it comes in. So in the future, I think it'd be really cool to use this information about these climatic preferences to better predict how various ant species might be affected by climate change. And uh, how might I do this? Okay. So I would use Wallace, which was, I mentioned it before, it's that ecological niche modeling program um, that allows you to do species distributions. And I would use it to basically um, create projection models that show predicted suitability of a species in that location, um, in a certain location, um, in, you know, like and ahead of time. Um, then I would find a way to compare that graph with some kind of graph of the current suitability. And I would try to analyze their differences um, and so I would try to figure out what's kind of like, what effect would climate change have on the suitability of an ant to a certain region. And I actually have some graphs to show. Um, these are my ecological niche models. This is for the rainbow ant, the Erdomormex coeruleus. It resides, as I mentioned, in the kind of upper northern area of, of Australia. So that's the map you're seeing. Um, the map on the left here is the um, current suitability rate. So this is where um, the ant is currently suited. So it's currently suited to live. So in the more yellowy parts, um, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult for the ant to live there. Um, and in the really red parts, it's pretty good for the ant to live there. So um, and they, they're like, they're pretty happy there. So um, as you can see, it's on the more coastal kind of areas of Australia that you end up with a lot of those ants having a, like being able to live there. Um, then if you shift to kind of like the right, the right graph, um, this shows the future suitability rate. So it's a, just a projection, it's just a prediction, but um, this is for 2050, so in 30 years, um, well, 29. Uh, but um, if you can see, it might not be super clear, but um, this is something that you would have to do, like the analysis and the comparison, but it's kind of visible that um, in the darker air, it's like there's more orange on that graph than there is on the left graph. So um, that's showing that there could potentially be more suit, like the ants could be more suitable inland. And in general, they'd be more suited to live in more parts of Australia in general. So that's a really interesting finding. You would definitely have to do a lot more comparisons to kind of understand that a little bit more. Um, but that's something I think would be really cool to do and I would really love to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask, but thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you, Camille. Did a great job. Um, so I guess I can kick off the questions first. You know, given all of these different methods that you that you did, what component of your research did you find the most challenging? Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, um, I'd say I don't know if it was an ex exactly like one component because they were all pretty hard. It was a very steep learning curve because I haven't taken biology yet in school. But um, I um, I think it was just in general like doing the parts separately it was like we had kind of like basically three steps like the wallace models and then um the phylogenetic tree and then we also had the um, climatic analysis so it was kind of like i was doing three separate parts and i was a little like i'm not sure how these all relate to each other and then as soon as i saw all the graphs um, and everything was simple i was like oh i get it this makes a lot of sense so i think the most difficult part was definitely just synthesizing all that information all right, okay, it looks like we have an, another question. How did you become interested in phylogenetic analysis? Um, so definitely not where I started out, uh, but I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, Dan introduced me to that whole concept. I had no clue what that was. Um, I think in general though, my kind of like desire, like the total, total background is that I was super, um, I really wanted to just learn more about ants and like the genetic differences between them and um, that was really inspired by E.O. Wilson, who's kind of like, he does a lot of studies on ants and he did a bunch of um, books on them. And I used to really love them when I was little. I would read all about the ants that rip each other's heads off. So I definitely was inspired by that. All right. What impact would increased suitable, increased suitable environments have on ants and the ecosystems they inhabit? Um, 
you know, I that that's something that's like a that's a really good question. Um, I don't exactly know, obviously, but um, I think I think there's a lot of different like potentially it could be good, right, for certain ants if there's more locations where they can live. Then that means they can spread out. That means they could hunt for more food. But um, you have to take into account all of the effects of climate change because with potentially increasing suitable environments, there's always downsides. So, for example, annual annual precipitation is supposed to be like generally rising um, at about I think it's like one percent for every. I'm not sure what the year count is, but it's pretty it's pretty significant. Like the amount of annual precipitation that should be increasing. So an increasing like something like that could really impact a species. So it's really difficult to tell. Um, like it could potentially be good, but there's other factors definitely that could play a part. All right, what can humans do to help protect or preserve ant habitats? Um, you know, I, that's, a, that's again, another great question. Um, but I mean, I would start with saying like, it's it's difficult when you get an ant infestation in your house, that's, that's one thing. Um, but I'd say like, if you see, I know there's a lot of kind of, um, I guess honoring the fact that they're they're still an, a species and they're still super interesting creatures and they're not just little little bugs you you know already want to squish and I'm somebody who like I'm the worst defender of that but it's something that you kind of have to learn and kind of learn to respect the creature so if you see them in the nature in nature like take some photos spread some awareness that kind of thing um, I don't know do research just getting passionate about it can also just help preserve other ant habitats. Oh, good question. What would you like to study next, you know, given everything that, you know, you've done? Oh, oh, definitely. I would love to look at those predicted suitability graphs and kind of do that future research. I, I'm super, I would really love to do that and kind of look at how, um, look at all as many effects as I can of climate change and see how that could affect ants. Um, I've seen I've seen a couple studies that have been done about um, how climate change, such as things like rising temperatures could affect um, the behavioral patterns and the social behaviors of different ants when they get involved with different species get involved with each other. And those studies are super, super interesting because the ants actually do make some choices as to like, for example, like who they want to pick as their enemies, like they'll conserve energy, they'll go after more enemies. It's all super interesting. So that would definitely be a longer process like that would be super super intense and that would probably have to be a physical experiment but yeah definitely that all right well um I, I guess i'll end with just asking you you know what was your favorite part about this whole experience definitely the learning curve like as much as i can complain about it i really enjoyed having to learn like not having to learn all that stuff but having that knowledge now feels really good and um it got me excited about it, which is just like, I don't know, something that I really value. So definitely the steep learning curve. <laughs> well, well, that's great. Um, wonderful job. And yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. Knowledge is power. So <laughs> yeah, um, without further ado, I'll let Leah take it away. Sure. Thank you very much, Camille and Daniel. Again, really, really good work and another very passionate student. So happy to have both of you. So now I'm going to bring on Tanner Dule to introduce his student. Hi, Tanner. Hi, Leah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Tanner. I am a uh, PhD student at UCLA, and there I study network theory in the context of ecology. So what are the aspects of food webs and mutualist networks that make them stable and have all the cool impacts on biodiversity that we see. And uh, this past uh, semester, I've had the great pleasure of mentoring Amelia Frost uh, and helping her develop a really fascinating project on how climate change is infecting, sorry, affecting invasive versus the native plants at a uh, regional park in the Bay Area. Amelia is a freshman in high school. And the fact that at her age and with the amazing amount of um, extracurriculars that she is juggling, she actually just placed onto the volleyball team at her school, which is an awesome accomplishment in addition to everything else that her unbelievably loaded plate is filled with. Uh, on top of all that, this semester she has been able to develop such a fantastic project. And uh, I am sure that she is just as excited to share it with everybody as I am to hear more about it. So without further ado, Amelia, take it away. Thank you, Tanner. Okay, so Frost, and right now I'm a freshman in the Marin School of Environmental Leadership, which is in 
Tarland High School. My mentor is Tanner Dule, and our project was on the native and invasive plants in China Camp. The introduction. So climate change is harming biodiversity. It's harming a lot of things, but biodiversity is definitely one of them. And the problem with that yeah. is that- Let's pause for just a sec. We don't see your presentation. Can you go back to where you weren't full screen and we'll see if we can get it back? And let's have you present one more time. Hmm. So we don't see it when you go full screen. It's totally okay if you want to just go from the edit mode. We do see it before you go full screen. All right, sounds good. Perfect, thank you. Okay, anyway, back to the topic at hand. Climate change, it's harming biodiversity. So the problem is that means that invasive species have an advantage, even though they already had an advantage because they're so tolerant and able to adapt to different situations. But now they have an even larger advantage because with the dramatic rises and falls in temperature, it's harder for native species who are a little bit more, what's the word, less tolerant <laughs> to uh, stay, stay up with them. Okay, so my research question was about how, ch how climate change will affect invasive and native plants within China camp. And I thought, well, it will obviously affect invasive species in a more positive way because they're so tolerant because they can handle so much. It doesn't mean they prefer that, but they can handle it a lot better than native species. In my materials and methods. So collecting data was the first part. We photographed plants throughout China camp. And so basically for four different trips, I went to different parts of China camp and I took photos of every plant I could find. I went to the woodlands, I went to the beaches, I went to the marshlands. And then once that was done, I used this website called iNatural iNaturalist where it's cited below. And what you do is you put in a picture and it will give you its best guess of what that plant is. Once we figured out all that, we used Calflora to find the data for each of the plants that we already identified. One, and then we put that all on a data sheet. Then we analyzed that data. So we put, so after using the data sheet, we put that data into R to create graphs that kind of showcased what we what we'd gotten. And then we had to interpret those results. So we compared them with our hypothesis. What happened? all that kind of thing. Here is actually some of the pictures that I took while I was in China camp. So the middle picture is just a broad picture of the woodlands in China camp. And on the sides are actually some of the plants that we identified and then put into Calflora and so on and so on. Like the purple plant on the side, the Primula hendersi or the shooting star. <laughs> Here are all our results. We use a multivariate analysis of variance, and we found that the temperatures uh, have a much more significant difference than the precipitation because the p-value has to be under 0 0.05 to show any significance, and that wasn't there for the precipitation. But it was there for the December min, the July max, and the annual temperature range. So for the non-native plants in the December min, they just they like a higher December min, a lower July max, and overall they have a lower temperature range than native plants, which actually isn't what we expected. Then we wanted to find out the like, well, what's actually happening with the temperature around China camp? I mean, but we couldn't find anything that was close, that was super close to China camp. So we found the San Francisco International Airport from 1950 um, until now. And we found that the December min is actually going up. So it's not getting warmer, but it's getting less 
cold, if that makes sense. And that's in indicated by the blue regression line right there. Okay, so what we expected was that invasive species would be more generalist, which means they're more tolerant. So uh, native species should be should be able to not handle as much. I mean, it's not what they prefer, but they should be able to not handle as much. We thought that the invasive species would have a higher July maximum and a lower December minimum. What we found was essentially the exact opposite. It's it's a lower July maximum and a higher December minimum, but it still proves our hypothesis because the temperature is changing, just not in the way that we thought. The, the winters are becoming more moderate, which still plays into the hands of the invasive species, leaving the native species to fend for themselves. Our next steps. One, we want to collect more data. Like with any research, we want to learn more, you know, uh, do more studies, everything. Number two, we want to look at predictions for future temperatures. So in the second, in the second uh, graph that, we sh that I showed, we looked at predictions from 70 years back, back to the 1950s. But we, and we saw that it's becoming a more moderate winter, but we didn't look at the predictions for future temperatures, which could connect to that and show like how it actually, and actually add a new layer to the project. Then number three, comparing climates. So what that means is we're going to, we, using Calflora, we were able to find the climates for things like uh, the native species, but we weren't actually able to see what the invasive species prefer and where their actual home climates are, not just in California. So if we did that, that could again add a new layer to the project. And then of course, we just want to extend the project to throughout California. You know, right now it's very centered in this small space, which is very diverse and it's a good example of California, but it's not California itself. And so expanding it would give it more depth. Here are my citations. So iNaturalist, CalFlora, the Friends of China Camp. So that's, those are the people who run China Camp right now or keep it, uh, well, we did. <laughs> and then there's the Wonderground, which we actually used for information for our second graph. Thank you for listening to my presentation. All right, Amelia, thank you so much for presenting your research for all of us. Uh, you did a fantastic job. It is quite a surprisingly nuanced study that you conducted, and I think you did a fantastic job at uh, sharing the most salient points of your research with uh, everybody uh, out there in, in Facebook and YouTube land listening. So now I'd love to uh, field some questions from the audience for you, and I guess I will uh, get started by asking, you went to China camp in the field many times, and uh, you went and photographed and ID'd a whole lot of plants on your own. And I'm kind of curious, when you looked at the native versus the non-native plants, did you find that the non-native or invasive species tended to be of a specific type of plant? Like were they more often grasses or trees or shrubs or did you find something else? Actually, no. A lot of the photos that I took were of small plant species, so like ones near to the ground, and they all were pretty similar. I'm, sh I'm sure if you looked through the photos and really analyzed them, you might be able to find a similarity with the non-native or invasive that wasn't there with the native, but I didn't identify that when I was out in the field. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, Another question from the audience is, what made you interested in studying invasive species in the first place? So I'm a freshman, and so I was in bio I was in biology, and a lot about what we talked about was invasive species and how they take over. And another thing we talked about was climate change and how that and how that whole thing works together. And going into this as a new thing for me, I want I wanted to do something that 
I knew a little bit of so that I could build off of it. And I also wanted to see how that affected something that I live so close to, like China Camp. Perfect. That is that is such a great answer to that question. Uh, taking what you know and, and building on it is what science is all about. Uh, another question from the audience. Do you think you could use your results to make predictions about native and non-native species in other areas? Yes, actually. Um, we. Uh, again, I wanted to expand so that we could also, you know, find more data, obviously, but yes, uh, it, the results that we found does play a role in the, in other studies other people have done, and I think we could use it to make predictions for both China Camp and other areas about how they'll be affected by the non-native and native ratio uh, with climate change, too. Awesome. Well, I suppose if we're waiting for more questions, I have one more for you. What was your favorite part of all of this? You were out in the field quite a bit and you you learned a lot about coding and R and running stats and a whole bunch of a whole slew of different scientific techniques. So what was your favorite part of conducting this research? Um, let's see. So this was a wonderful process at times because I am so busy. It was a little hard to uh, just like to push through, but it was actually amazing to be out in the field because I haven't done a lot of that kind of study before. I've done things where in school they give you graphs and they give you things where you have to analyze, but you don't get to go and collect your own data. And that was a new thing. And since I had you, Tanner, to help me understand all those things, it was it became really fun and a way for me to learn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. There's definitely something very special about going out in the field and asking a question and then taking it home and, and being able to uh, answer that question using statistics. It's, it's definitely a very rewarding process. And hopefully anybody, any uh, other students out there watching are equally inspired by this and all the other studies tonight to uh, pursue science on their own. And it looks like there's one more question from the audience. Um, as a freshman, do you plan to continue on this specific research path looking at plants or to diversify and explore other areas of research that you might be interested in? As a freshman, I'm still figuring out where my classroom is because of online. But um, yes, actually, I would love to continue on this specific research path, biology and everything that I've gone through uh, lately is, amazing and uh i love plants i always have <laughs> and i think that it would be really amazing but then again i'd also like to go into other areas of research as well but i think i'd like to stick in this one fantastic well thank you so much for your presentation and uh yeah i guess that that does it thank you so much great thank you tanner thank you amelia more wonderful research. So proud of all the students that presented tonight. So we are gonna wrap up and I just wanna remind you all that if you liked what you saw here and you're a parent or a teacher, feel free to recommend our summer research program where students will get the same kind of opportunity to create a research project around something that they are super passionate about. And you can find our registration information on our website. Also, if you have more lingering questions, feel free to leave them here on Facebook or YouTube and we'll get them over to the students so you can learn more about their awesome research. And with that said, I hope you all have a wonderful evening.